posting it to the internet? Yeah, it's just kind of weird. Yeah. Um... Hello and welcome to a new episode of Enterprising Minds. Um, you know, before we we jump into the three topics of today, uh, the Met Gala was this uh, this past week, and you know, Ruthie and I are quite into at least paying attention to Fashion Weeks and and just keeping an eye on it. I'm not saying I'm at all. Uh, super knowledgeable about it but alex i wanted your hot take on who was the best dressed for the met gala <laughs> we did buy t-shirts uh sponsored by wait no we don't have them as a sponsor but it'd be hilarious if they were uh five dollar tees or six dollar tees <laughs> which is exactly the cost of this t-shirt <laughs> and could I you comment it. on the legacy of carl lagerfeld and how exactly. it fit into the theme this year <laughs> yeah, yeah, they all look great. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, so now that we're now that we're done with that intro, I have to say I did like Jared Leto's cat costume, um, and Mary J. Blige is amazing in anything she does. Uh, that was pretty much my takeaway from at least what I saw on on New York Times. Um, Hope that the pearls stay like let's just run with the pearls motif mm -hmm. let's back. it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be just the sort of conservative lady situation <laughs> cool now so going to a um the marketing focus which is why uh we're here and and people have told us they listen to us um ruthie why don't you go First, what's your topic this week? I want to know how you guys got into SEO. Mm. Oh, that's a good question. That is a good one. Uh, my topic is the Tilt, uh, an organization that was started by Joe Polizzi after he sold Content Marketing Institute. Uh, just came out with some uh, research on content entrepreneurs or the creator economy. They wanted a quick talk on um, so, Alex, what do you got this week? This one's going to be kind of a, another AI-focused one, but it's where AI fits on your team or does it not fit on your team? And then a bit of a hot take on IBM just because that was really frustrating to me. So I'm just going to rant about that for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ruthie, why don't you uh, get us started with how you got how you got in, and then we'll talk about ours. Oh, shoot, I didn't know I had to go first. Damn it. All right. <laughs> um, I, I suppose I stumbled to an extent, um, which is to say that I, like many of, of my generation and of millennials, um, had the wonderful skill of being good with websites and being good with technology. And uh, that's how I landed my first sort of marketing tech job was they needed somebody who could manage websites and who sort of could speak to developers and I fit the bill. So I I started off just by doing basic web updates, doing redesigns and um, expanded into other areas of marketing, but it's hard not to be in the web space and looking at your web traffic with then also realizing, oh, right, there's this thing called organic traffic and um, people search on the web and then they find your website. How do we go about making sure that more people find your website? Um, so it, for me, it was very organic in the sense that it wasn't something I set out to do. It was something that we had limited resources at a nonprofit I was working at. We were, we were just trying to do the best with what we had. Um, we didn't have a lot of digital expertise built in, um, but in the process of trying to improve our web experience and the process of trying to improve our marketing, um, it, it it's hard not to run into SEO on the way. Um, so it was sort of just part of the bread and butter of what I was doing at the nonprofit. Um, and then when I was looking to expand into, into different career space, um, 
I found out that you could just do it full time. You could your your full time job could just be search engine optimization, and that you could be there was different branches of it, and you could do the technical side. You could do content. Um, that it wasn't just an all in one thing that you happen to do as part of managing a website. Um, and so then I I uh, found my way onto an SEO team that focused more on technical and platform and. And that was the uh, happily ever after. So what kind of attracted you to it, though? I mean, of all those different things you were doing on a website, you could have gotten into graphic design, front end development, back end development. There's so many other areas, too, that you were touching. Well, that's fair. That's a good question, Alex. I think part of it was the analytics. Um, it, It was fascinating to see. Oh, what were people thinking? How were they stumbling upon us and and seeing that show up and and seeing, okay, we're getting more traffic for these particular terms. I wonder why that is or or what are people looking for when they're um when they're looking for those terms? Um and Google Analytics, I mean, first love, right? <laughs> It's just a wonderful place to explore. And then you then you realize, oh, there's this other thing that Google creates, Google Search Console. I, I can't remember what it used to be called. Was that Webmaster Tools at the time? Yeah. Um, and so a lot of it was just interest and um, pulling the thread of what are our users doing? How are they getting here? Um, and, and how do we think the way that perhaps our customers or users are thinking? Very cool. Dave, do you want to go next? I had a similar one where I've I've had this hypothesis and I've said it um, before where, you know, SEO is an interesting field because you don't go to school for it. There, You have to be introduced to it, right? Um, either accidentally through analytics or, you know, somebody... Um, somebody saying, Hey, here's SEO here, go do it. And that was kind of, that was kind of my, my introduction. I was always the, the kind of business minded guy on any of the the music projects I was on. Um, and you know, back in like high school, college and, and after that, and then, you know, as I was, a guitar teacher and, and recently graduated into the, the great recession with, you know, arts degrees, um, I had to pay the bills. And so I had a creative writing degree and so I could write and I could play guitar. Uh, Not much has changed since then. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And um, so I did some freelance writing gigs and the more you, you know, you get better clients and and better projects, the better your stuff does. So uh, just looking into, into that, um, the, primary introduction to it was probably um, I did some ghostwriting for plastic and cosmetic surgeons and their, their blogs and um, had to learn the difference between the two of them. Right. Cause there's the, it's a big difference actually. Um, but essentially the, the guy who hired me for it was like, here's, um, here's, here, here's, here's your client list. Here's, uh, who we want you to write for. And, uh, if you have any questions here, go to copy blogger. And that's how I discovered Brian Clark and, um, the copy blogger stuff and, and that whole community of people, um, that that's how I got into, you know, the traditional sense of copywriting, you know, within, marketing and advertising because before it was just yeah i'm a creative writer i can write in any kind of voice i can write in you know any kind of lens or whatever else but then honing in that okay how do you actually write to persuade people rather than make it interesting and fun and you know whatever else um and from there it was just you know continuing the balloon because you know part of it too was with the music projects it was okay i've built this website because that's what every band that I know of has, I've got this, you know, album I've produced. How do I get people to know about it? If I have no money for advertising or shooting a music video or whatever else, right? Like, how do you do that? Well, you can do it through the website um, and through social and through any of that. So that's how I got into that 
kind of content creation and promotion side of things outside of writing. Um, you know, like most things, you, you start with mimicry because that's your introduction. And then you kind of find the way that you like to do it and, you know, build up from there. So, yeah. Cool. And you kind of stuck with it just because of the, your kind of continued interest in learning more about it or just became the thing that you're just good at. So you keep on doing it or it's still I, the creative aspect. No, I, I have the personality of if I'm into it, I'm 150% into it. And if I'm not into it, there is no amount of persuasion that will get me to do it. <laughs> it will be physically painful if I'm not into it. Um, which on the one hand serves me pretty well because then I have, I just, I'm used to saying no to things that just aren't of interest. Right. Um, the thing that keeps me interested in it. Um, and I was reminded of this with Ruthie introducing me to the, you know, Rory Sutherland, uh, was the behavioral psychology aspect of it. Right. Because the idea of influencing someone while they're making decisions about something they've identified they need without being next to them is a really interesting problem to solve, right? Because if, if I'm sitting and talking to you and, and you say, I, I'm, I'm looking for a painting guy, who, who would you recommend? I can just you know give you the phone number and the name of a guy I've used and said, yeah, he did good enough work. And that's pretty much good enough for most people, right? But if you need to know something, um, or you're trying to go down a rabbit hole of, of some kind, um, make comparisons, then, you know, you have to, you have to put in the work and that's a totally different kind of writing. That's a totally different kind of, um, kind of setup. So I've always been through the, the writing. I've always been more of that ecosystem kind of guy. Like let's build that marketing ecosystem where you can just kind of pull the levers of stuff and adapt to how the market changes around you. Not just this single tactic, um, you know, myopic kind of focus that the market kind of wants us to be in, <laughs> uh, as you know, marketing professionals, um, because I think it's more powerful with, uh, the, the connection of everything, you know, how about you, Alex? Um, I don't know, similar story, just based on timeline because of the great recession. Um, so in college, I was originally, uh, economics major. And that lasted for a while. It was dual, doubled with like a general business degree, which is pretty common to do. And then basically, as I got higher and higher levels of economics, eventually it became theoretical. And you start to see where a lot of assumptions are basically built into some of the equations that are really used quite often, like GDP and other things like that. I was a lot into um, unemployment and then monetary theory. That was kind of my two focus areas. Um, and you get really into that kind of stuff. I mean, fiat money and currencies and stuff. There's there's some pretty fascinating aspects of just kind of how the world works. And that's what I always liked about economics was it was trying to kind of pose a theory of how things work. Mm -hmm. But it eventually got too way too theoretical. And then it started near my senior year, started looking at job prospects and dentists, economists, they have something in common, which is high rates of depression. <laughs> And alcoholism and suicide. And I was like, wow, that's really bad. <laughs> and, it drops uh, off after you go through your PhD, then things are okay. It's just a PhD <laughs> period. That... See also musicians, writers. <laughs> I know. It was like, wow, this is set myself up for success on this one. Um, and then looking at like, you know, especially when focused on monetary policy or especially on unemployment, you're Generally speaking, that's a government job where you're sent off to some um, town or city that's just not doing well. And then you try your hardest to try to turn things around without much help. And you also live there, which is also wasn't very attractive to me either. Um, so I was trying to find something a lot more applicable and not theoretical. So that, that was kind of one of the main things. So I upped my general business to a marketing degree. Did like one extra semester, so did a little extra year or extra half year, and then I have a ridiculously over earned e econ minor. <laughs> As it turns out, I was like a class away from a BS in it, so whatever, not really of use. And then at that point, same thing, kind of great recession. So I have a marketing degree, and while I was at 
school, I knew a guy who knew a guy. So he got me into uh, a tech job on campus because I didn't have a car. So I worked a tech support kind of a job basically throughout all of college. So I had a resume that wasn't, there was a ton of random jobs, which you can go through at some point, which is just fun because they're bizarre. But then I also had the most recent thing was a couple of years of tech support and a marketing degree. So, you know, digital marketing, that became kind of the answer there. I will say as sort of a foreshadowing, uh, the number of jobs Alex has had and the diversity of jobs Alex has had is something for us to discuss in the future because it's it's fantastic. Yeah, we could add one to each episode. It would take us through like ha- at least half a year. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out next week. Exactly. Let's, let's go down the rabbit hole of yet another bizarre story that Alex somehow you know, almost died. Was it? too many of those and those jobs as well. So that's fun. Um, yeah, a lot of decent paying, but not great workplaces. Um, but that was kind of the stuff that I had is for a, a resume. So I kind of had a junk resume. So basically I was trying to figure out, you know, what on earth would someone hire me for? So I applied like crazy, which I'm sure you guys, you know, had a very similar story to that. And there was an agency basically nearby who took a chance on me of, being a entry level, actually analytics. So that's where I started was doing all the monthly reporting, which was awful. Um, the awful aspect, not so much from the data, the data was interesting. And Ruthie, I kind of had a shared experience of the kind of the fascination of learning more about what people do on a site and the fact that you're able to find out what they do on a site and what they're interested in and what they're not interested in and how they click around on a site. It, it's fascinating stuff. It's like, I didn't really know that all that stuff was being tracked. You kind of have that kind of curiosity and then there's the next piece of it of like okay so how do we get people in the right direction um i say it was awful because monthly reporting is awful because you suddenly owe a cl- like 16 or 20 clients a report and you have three days to get them all done and that's awful so you know the i hated that part of agency life oh it's terrible that. yeah I'm back in it right now it's pretty awful um and then on the fun side are they really looking and if they do look are they getting anything out of it? Yeah, fun story about that. Once worked at an agency, we we had a horrible time going through all these reports. Um, and they had to be printed off on legal size sheets of paper, which is bigger than a regular size sheet of paper, which who has a printer even stocked with that size? Um, but it was hundreds of data points that we manually typed in from GA and AdWords. It was ridiculous. So eventually I made a mistake and I had to tell a client, you know, we had this awkward meeting of being like, I'm so sorry, I totally messed up. I, you know, flipped some figures, flipped two numbers, and that totally changes how your month went. Um, and the response was, oh, I didn't see it. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so eventually I convinced my boss, and this took, I think, a couple mistakes too, to saying like, look, data entry-wise, straight numbers, like on average, you you know, mess up every it's like 4%, 3% or something like that at the time. So if you have hundreds of figures on a page, there's going to be problems. So I contacted all of our clients, called them all. And the common response was, oh, we can't open the file. Because we what? use max numbers instead of Excel. <laughs> and we save it in a numbers format, which nobody had. <laughs> so for months, we've been freaking out about these reports. And nobody ever looked at them. So eventually we created like an auto GA report that everybody was fine with that was good enough it was so dumb just so dumb the amount of stress from the, nothing yeah that was one thing that happened for i created word templates for that because it was the same thing screenshots a little bit yeah. of commentary which really honestly didn't change all that much each month um so you just take the screenshots put it in you know send it over until yeah. finally, yeah, it was the same thing. I'm like, you know what? No, we're going to do this real time when we have our monthly meetup. We're going to open up your thing and we're going to talk about it. See if anything jumps out at you. And if not, if you don't feel like talking about it, then we can use the time more strategically. And then I'm not wasting your time and I'm not wasting your money. So, you know, how about that? That seems to be better. <laughs> exactly. it, that piece, it's analytics are important and seeing what is what's working and what's not, but you have to have a conversation. Otherwise it's just a sheet of paper or a document that no one opens. Yep. And if they did open, what's, what's the end result? 
Yeah, no, you get so many questions about like pages per visit, bounce rate. I'm glad they switch or switching engagement rate, but stuff like that too is like there's a there, some of that requires kind of a technical explanation as well as you know, leading mm -hmm. someone kind of through those figures or someone who's seen a couple different sites saying, no, this looks weird. Not over the business owner. But um, switching back, so quick SEO kind of wrap up of how I got into it. Um, basically started analytics and that didn't actually take too long until I switched out of that because the guy who was doing SEO was more interested in doing uh, user experience. So he moved over to that mm -hmm. and I took basically that role of doing SEO work and I found it fascinating because it's similar, at least in my mind, I've seen it similar as to economics. Because you know what's going in, you know what's coming out, and there's this big black box in the middle, so it's a black box problem. And those are fun because there is no answer to a black box problem. You just keep kind of poking at it and trying to figure out different theories of saying, well, this went, went like this, maybe that's the way it works, and then you find that's not true and you try something else. So it's like this continued curiosity and fascination with it that really kind of kept me into it. And then quickly from there, I got kind of sucked into like the world of affiliate marketing, of online, you know, drop shipping, online sites, kind of in terms of kind of solopreneur, entrepreneurial kind of aspect of it. And while a lot of it, yeah, 99% of what you find online related to that is complete snake oil BS. There is some grain of truth behind it of being able to build an online business. And of course, many people do successfully do that. It takes a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of years, which is what most things gloss over. But the ability to do it, the fact that one person can do it, like there's, it just seems like such an opportunity as well. And that always has gotten kind of stuck in my head of like SEO is a kind of an aspect of what we do with technology, but there's so much more around it. And that's the piece that really has kept me into SEO was the fact that it's tied into everything. So at one point I was managing a team of people in different countries who were writing content. And eventually I created a team of editors because there was so much content they were creating. So I was up at, you know, 3 a.m. having these chats with people on the other side of the world who were creating copy for me. And I'm like, that's crazy i mean it's just such a random opportunity and eventually i had like a data entry team as well doing other random stuff and then you know just doing all these different pieces of it and all these different areas that it keeps pulling you into and different conversations with different people who are specialists in other areas that just makes it an engaging interesting job if it was basically like doing my taxes my gosh i would not last like as fascinating as that can be no no, it's not that interesting. Like it has to have more engagement, more complexity, more people, more experts, you know, more touch points. And that's kind of what kept, what's kept me in it. The fact that you have an economics degree answers some some things for me. Yeah, uh, probably does. Make some probably. make some things click. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was actually wondering with uh, Ruthie if you saw some parallel when your background with the kind of the black box curiosity or did you see it kind of in a different way i never thought of it through that lens before but it makes a lot of sense and even more so that the second part of it's connected to so many other different things that you can sort of pull threads on um, and explore i think that that to me is perhaps more but my background's in economics and finance in terms of what I studied in college as well. Like I like the data side. I don't want to do only, only data analysis, but it's something that um, is sort of been a current throughout uh, my intellectual interests. And so I think in that case, it's similarities. I think the black box thing is a bit more of sort of the scientific approach that I haven't had as much, but, um, but you guys have introduced me. <laughs> yeah it's it is an interesting job also because at least from like the if you look at it from the data standpoint it's data but it's like dave was saying it's so much human on human mm -hmm. element and psychology on top of it yes like why would someone type in this phrase yes they search it 720 times if we forget about bucket average and all the rest of that kind of crap they search it 720 times a month but what does that mean? What are they actually looking for? Are they actually my audience? Is it some high school students who is trying to figure out what is 
leukemia or before we start talking about treatment and local hospitals and you know where a particular hospital might have a treatment option um or we can talk about other topics as well but it's the exact same kind of question of trying to get within the searcher's head and really within their fully within their shoes to really understand where are they in this journey to solve this problem like dave was saying like at what point are they in and where are they going to go next and where can we kind of guide them and lead them if they're in this stage versus this stage you know what kind of content would they want what what kind of hook will our content have that will convert them or try to nudge them in this direction toward our product line mm -hmm. and that's i think is another big connection back to economics for me too is you know economics is very much the study of human behavior and human interactions specifically in a, a trading environment um, but it looks at incentives it looks at how people respond um, to different incentives and that's that's very much what we do in the SEO world as well is taking a look at how are people interacting on the web? How are they responding to, you know, say changes in the search interface? All of a sudden you get additional questions that changes how people respond. Um, and that's, that's fascinating to me. I mean, the economics of marketing is maybe a topic for another time, but just as a little bit of it, right. One of, one of the, the reasons for marketing in the marketplace is the spread of information that's a key um way that marketing helps sort of grease the wheels of our economies and that's what search and the internet is all about is finding information the big world out there that's actually a nice um segue into some of the research i wanted to talk about um not just with the content creation, but I remembered another one that I'm going to shout out. So I have two I'm stealing. I'm slipping two in. Um, SEMrush recently released uh, their search market traffic trends for 2022. They analyze um, the top 50,000 domains um, from their trends data, uh, some ridiculous number of pages uh, on the internet. And I thought what was interesting, you know, we talked about search always being ever changing and, you know, the human behavior behind that always changing and all of that in one of the um, in one of the graphs. And, um, you know, if you go to the go to the show notes on, on the website, we'll have links to all these things um, shows that retail traffic, travel, industry traffic and fashion traffic all you know, from the graph pretty much like tanked over 2022. Um, right off the top of my head, I haven't done too much research into this yet, but this is where I want your, your thoughts on either validating the hypothesis or not. Um, is the impact of TikTok on the, from those industries and preventing searches there? Um, with the retail side, I mean, it's easier just to open up Amazon and buy whatever it is you're going to buy or, you know, Target app or Walmart app or whatever, you know, whatever stores you tend to frequent, right? Um, if you are unsure, you go to TikTok, check out the influencers, go to Instagram, check out the influencers, see what's there, you know, maybe buy from the stores uh, right there. Um yeah. What are your what are your thoughts on the changing search landscape? For the three? You said fashion, retail. Fashion and apparel, retail and travel. On travel, are they thinking like, this is my blog about traveling? Or is it like airline mm -hmm. traffic? Uh well travel I think travel would be all of the above. All of the above. Mm -hmm. They group it by domains, so it'd be what they consider that category of that domain to be in. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I was just thinking: is it more the media about travel, or is it the the travel as a service? That's yeah. all. That would still be under the travel industry, no matter how you you break it apart, though. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, some of that. I wonder, COVID effect, kind of ongoing effect. Um, fashion, I can definitely see 
kind of going downhill along with like my t-shirt t-shirt choices clearly i mean represent that's COVID, man that's COVID. <laughs> um there's probably some changes with that retail i think you're absolutely on the nail on the head with that one there's so many data points out there about how e-commerce searches basically start on amazon they don't go to google first you're not really looking around so that traffic basically just hits that one place but why traffic to Amazon would drop. I'm kind of surprised by search traffic, sure, because they're just going to go there straight, you know, direct traffic. It's not organic at the moment. Or, you know, within an app, because again, not organic. Um, retail overall, I mean, they've struggled a bit post COVID to try to bring people back into stores because people got so comfortable shopping online. So I see some of that. Um, we've also seen, I don't know it's totally anecdotal but i've definitely seen when searching around the same kind of major domains pop up a lot there's always been you know a theory that google rewards bigger brands but there's you know a lot of technical reasons for ranking factors of why actually they do well based on you know backlinks and content and a bunch of other factors including like they probably have full-time seos and small places places don't mm -hmm. um but I keep finding a lot of big brands, even for searches that are kind of tentatively attached to them. And I bet there's probably a better, smaller site that's more specialized. Um, I've, I don't know. It seems like the number overall number of domains and it seemed to be, I don't know if, if I'm remembering it right, but SEMrush kind of agreed with that. The overall number of domains is dropping, kind of unique domains. So I keep kind of wondering kind of how pushed we are towards certain venues and the more pushed you are to a particular brand, the more likely you are to go direct to them and not search for them. So you kind of create that, create that push. I think what stands out most to me is how much I don't have a gut reaction to this, <laughs> <laughs> which is to, to a great extent, my search web behavior has not, changed fundamentally since I started using the internet. I mean, or at least the last five, maybe not started using the internet. That's changed drastically. But in the last, say, five years, my my behavior with different websites, with search, with different applications hasn't changed a ton. And this, I think, is why it's really important to pay attention to data like what they're publishing or to see what consumer behavior is and consumer trends are because my gut reaction is very different than say somebody 10 years younger than i am sure yeah there's a state of voice search that came out too i was talking about one in three adults basically use voice search which i hardly ever do if it is it's through siri and it's usually pretty bad to be honest but like people when they're using voice search they're using it was an average of like 43 words in a search which wow. man, that's specific. Like that's not looking for a Chinese restaurant near you. That's <laughs> they got one very specific dish and they were looking located for a Sichuan here. cuisine located in Fairfax, Virginia, that was <laughs> yeah. recommended by this food blogger. <laughs> and is open between these ears. Because <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know. Like you to get to that many words, that's a very specific search. Um just to throw in the economic aspect too. And looking at those three categories, those are also three categories that are usually kind of on the edge. So when people's budgets are tight, they don't travel as much, they don't buy many new clothes. I mean, a lot of that stuff kind of changes. Mm -hmm. So depending on consumer kind of trust, which I thought recently has been pretty solid, um, that would be a, a factor, but I don't know. I'm not sure, Dave. The, um, the limited number of domains that are being shown stood out to me. Um, you know, during the, during the pandemic, I was fortunate enough to be asked to, uh, present at one of the local universities and I created a deck around reputation management and search marketing. And in that, I found a quote from Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, where back in 2013, I believe. He said that reputation is going to be more and more important um, and basically the key commodity of the internet moving forward, right? And I would, 
I was reminded of that with our, our discussion on AI and the ability to kind of explode content out there, right? We talked about the drop shipping websites that, you know, you can just send products from Alibaba to Amazon and then, you know, say you have an e-commerce store and what do you do to support that? You have the AI generated content to go spam the hell out of people. Um, and none of it's really good, high quality, but there's enough people who would go for it and buy it that it it's, you know, reasonable to do something like that. Um, in order to not have those types of uh, websites prominent in the search results, I could see why the search engines would want a trusted name to be higher up because it's a more consistent experience. And there's probably customer service on the other side of it <laughs> instead of the drop shipper guy. Right. Um, so yeah, I thought that, I thought that was interesting. And they will have to wait and see how it plays out, how it develops around that. Um, so I think that piece is really interesting, which is you've got this huge influx and number of websites content, uh, because our technology is getting better. It's easier. Even if let's set aside some of the AI generated stuff, it's just easier to create a website, Mm -hmm. just make it right. And so one reaction from from the different search engines trying to figure out how do we filter all this stuff is to rely more on the the known names or the backlinks or or figuring out some way to filter out the nonsense and what's lost in the meantime is you don't get those search results of here's somebody who's super passionate about this topic and and is writing in-depth articles right. which i miss i've noticed that i haven't been able to find those as easily as before unless i already know about them or have have them linked to it's much harder to run into those via via your average google result yeah, I have two points to mention, but then I'm going to take this in a slightly different bend. Um, first one, Yandex accidentally at some point released their ranking signals. And Yandex is the major search engine in Russia. Um, so not the the top ones like Google, Bing, even Baidu by population has a bigger you know user base. But one of the ranking signals, this is again, the top search engine in Russia. One of their ranking signals is that they devalue Russian websites, <laughs> .ru websites, they drop them down. And they also uh, up Wikipedia. That's just like two random factors that they basically applied in, which was pretty funny. But I mean, your again, previous comment on, you know, manual data sorting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, quality websites too. I mean, we've, we're definitely seeing some factor there enough to say that, you know, we, we believe our population would be more interested in a site that doesn't actually even have their name kind of dot are you kind of stuck into it. That's, that's a pretty big, pretty big point. Uh, the next one would be that I want to make is about programmatic SEO. So like TripAdvisor, this is a good example to explain programmatic SEO. Um, if you search for a random city, you may come across an article that says the best activities in Duluth, Bemidji, Afton, wherever, some tiny town. And it's like, wow, they wrote a, yet another article on this tiny town. No, they created thousands of them, thousands of these articles and to cover basically all the cities of interest. So they spawned all this content that's covered up probably all these bloggers because likely that they're going to rank a little bit better than the random blogger from some tiny town that says, you know, fun things to do in my tiny town. Um, Which gets to my question to you guys of has SEO degraded the web, kind of the web experience? Pollution on the internet. Yeah. I mean, you talk about spam. I mean, really this is... Mm -hmm search engine spam not spam being sent your email inbox this is i do think that that's a um that would be a topic for a completely different episode <laughs> <laughs> we might have to bring in some people to interview on that topic as well yeah i'm gonna write that down um i mean short answer off yes to a degree 
Yeah, because it's, you start yeah. playing the game. You, you're you're gaming the search engines is what you're doing, and then you throw in some pretty uh, pretty awesome technology into that, and you've got yourself a mess. Yeah, I'm gonna have to think on that one before I say something dumb. <laughs> we can totally hold on. <laughs> There's a lot I think we can go kind of back and forth on pro con of. You know, is it improving because of the education of the audience's interests or is it negative because we're getting to you know think about this in a pretty negative way where we're just spawning thousands of articles you know are you creating a moat that's effective moat is it something that's actually useful and really is useful? the landscape of the internet changing in terms of where where we are i remember there it used to be the cool thing to make a map of the internet you know where you you know, Facebook would be sort of a region and, you know, maybe LinkedIn would be a smaller region. These, are, And I, I think that concept is still applicable. There's different areas of where we interact in different ways on the internet and the, the magnitude and importance of those shifts over time. And, and one way they shift over time is by, you know, search engines being spammed. And so people go elsewhere because it's not helpful. It's not getting them what they need. And that also kind of pushes along search engine development too. I mean, they try to clean up those results. So then certain tactics are no longer used. You know, it's... Well, and that's the piece where, you know, I mean, for the last 10 years, people have been saying voice search is going to kill, you know, yeah. the search engines. And it's just, it's just not. What I think is going to assist in voice search is a AI and and like chat gpt like with what bing is is doing i think that that makes more sense from the voice search perspective than it does the actual serp traditional you know um phone or or laptop uh serp experience just because it is that one answer to you know then say do you want more information like that's one of the things that I appreciate about, you know, Bard or, um, you know, Microsoft Sing of, hey, here's the answer, but do you want to, do you want to search it, find out more information on the topic, or are you satisfied with the answer? I appreciate that a little bit more than, than just the, the standalone GPT, where it's a, bleh, here's the answer. Um, really good question though, Alex. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm kind of thinking back to it was actually a fantastic webinar that Dave shared out um, from Clayton Christensen. It was a speech that I did at Google. And to be perfectly honest, I've so far gone through about half of it's like an hour and a half, gone through about half of it. Um, but he kept, keeps talking about jobs to be done. And basically, you can look at long term stability of a corporation, especially when they're tied towards this job that human beings have and they're trying to get it done. So, Use an example of like shipping. Shipping has getting some product from here to there has always been a thing. It used to be a horse and a cart, and then it was a car, and then now it's you know FedEx. Um, learning and figuring out information that has always been a thing. I mean, you used to kind of go throughout the ages. The technology has changed, but the job hasn't basically, and that was his main kind of main point. And I think of AI more clearly through that lens, because if you're satisfied enough, which that is also a common mistake I think a lot of businesses make is they try to go for the perfect, but most people are good enough with good enough. You know, that's enough. Mm -hmm. um, they don't need perfect and good enough might be chat GPT's answer. You know, it's the one result because they got a quick question and they just want the one result. It used to be that you'd have to look it up in maybe an encyclopedia and the encyclopedia would say it and that's all you have. So that's the one answer. Again, you're not really left with much more and there's not really a great way to question that answer that's given to you. Mm -hmm. And people were perfectly satisfied with that at one point. So that was fine. I've also noticed this is just kind of a random maybe ageism thing, but kind of the bar chat random question has kind of died off because it's not the, I wonder if, this happened or something like that. And then somebody nearly pulls out their phone and Googles it and gives the answer. And that's it. Where it used to be kind of a, a discussion topic. And they're like, no, you, you've got to be wrong. It, you know, the record for whatever could no way be 50 feet. You know, it's got to be more like 10 feet. And then you go back and forth and you create this whole you know conversation off of it. 
but now you pull your phone and you're like, nope, the longest whatever jump or whatever you know answer is that, now that. that I think GPT is going to solve this. Well, that's the thing. That's where hallucinations. It's just perfect for bar conversations. Is GPT right on this? Oh, the hallucination questioning the value, questioning the <laughs> for us. You know what else is really good for hallucinations? <laughs> Rail whiskey. <laughs> so you don't need GPT. You can just <laughs> eventually become obstinate. Uh, no, it's got to be. 30. <laughs> Google says it isn't. No, it's got to be. <laughs> well, no, I mean, that is the origin story of the Guinness Book of World Records. I mean, did you guys know that? No. Tell us. That Guinness and and the the whole bar conversation around what's the biggest you know <laughs> long jump someone's ever done. So they went out and they started the Guinness Book of World Records so that you could distribute that and then settle the bar fights <laughs> before they became you know full full on brawls. Um, that is amazing. I hope this is true, and I'm not even going to Google it to find out. I'm just absolutely, it's it. true. See, that I was a perfect example. Good enough. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ruthie. It says Guinness on the book. It has to be right. <laughs> <laughs> but how did they measure it? Was it really? Is it metric feet? There's no such thing as metric feet. <laughs> How'd they get the dog to jump in the first place? <laughs> no. Um, to your point about the internet changing, I'll just, you know, touch on this quickly because, you know, we do have the third one uh, to do. With the the tilt research that came out on, on content entrepreneurship, uh, that's the term that, you know, Joe Polizzi is using for this creator economy thing because he wanted to segment away from the hobbyists or the the social influencers, right? He, he He's very particular on... Um, how there are really kind of three main categories of creator. There's the hobbyist who's doing it on the side just for fun. You know, I have this blog because it's a topic I'm into. Um, there's the social media influencers, which is really kind of, you know, you just, you're trading fame for money, basically, and attention. Uh, and then you have this other category that he's dubbing content entrepreneurs, which is really a digital content first you know, business model um, where you go out, you either have some knowledge and uh, some expertise that you can then build a platform around and, you know, go convince people that, you know, they should, they should either buy from you or, or whatever else. Um, you know, and I think a lot of us marketers, because we're creative people kind of inherently, or we, we see problems and opportunities to solve all over the place. We kind of dabble in it or whatever else. But, uh, you know, one of the questions that they, they asked uh, the network of people that they had was how long did it take you to build a successful creator business? Um, and some interesting things kind of jumped out. So from the moment you launch your project, it takes on average 4.9 months to earn your first dollar. Uh, it takes a little over a year for revenue to exceed your expenses. Uh, most people switch to full-time content entrepreneurship at 12.7 months, uh, but it takes 18 months, a little more for them to be fully supporting themselves off of the business. Um, and then 18.8 months for them to hire their first help, you know, whether it's, uh, another person or whatever else. Um, so I thought that was really interesting because it is actually the kind of the roadway for the digital business kind of thing, right? Like now you could do some, some modeling or, or, um, some estimations on, on how long it will take you to actually be successful on this. Um, and they go into like, you know, how are people funding this? What are you actually devoting your time to? Because a lot of the things with the creator economy, you're thinking, oh, I really like, you know, guitars or makeup or whatever. Like I'll spend most of my time creating content around that. And that's false. You spend less than half your time creating content, um, according to this, this report. It's only 46% of your time is content creation. The rest of it is promotion, distribution, business admin, other things. Um, and 
what is it? The most profitable monetization tactics for creators in this uh, space is consult consulting and coaching, uh, publishing books, which again, we've talked about uh, the, the ebook spam with the, the AI stuff. Um, but then the online courses and workshops, which might actually be, you know, the next thing prone for, for AI um, pollution and um, the affiliate marketing after that. And then after that, it just kind of tanks into the other stuff that, that you do, but it does seem to be kind of an all in kind of thing where the agency and consulting model is blending with a media model, which is blending into, you know, a lot of these things that we've, you know, we would traditionally look at and, you know, through this kind of business model, I think it does go to the things that we talked about previously of, you know, you, you publish your content on your own platform thinking that search engines will pick it up. But at the same time, what do you have to do? You have to actually draw attention to it. So the search engines will pay attention to your site. And you do that through the webinars, the podcasts, the um, the local events and everything else that you do. And so it does become uh, like we talked about on one of the first episodes, the kind of SEO and organic search as kind of an overall health metric of your business rather than just, am I doing really well in this one particular tactic? Um, so again, I'll drop the link to the, the research in the show notes on the website and uh, you can go check that out. But um, as I've described it, cause I, I know, I, I think I shared it with you guys previously, but as I've described it, does anything jump out, um, jump out to you on that? Yeah, man, I wanna know what the drop off rate is. I mean, 18 months seems very quick to me, which makes me think this is taking a look at the people who have succeeded and who are left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or if the, you're getting rid of the hobbyists, then you shorten the runway quite a bit. Yes. Right. What's that, it take to get within this survey group? Like you well, said, well, well. this was asked, this was a survey asked of members of the spin. Is um, it I wonder if you have a selective audience who's paying, like, are they paying, you know, 1500 bucks a year to get access and these are the people you're asking, or is this a pretty wide free network kind of a thing? Um, so this was a survey of 1,043 creators, 397 individuals who want to be creators. Um, they have the methodology here. Um, Okay, so they found people on the other stuff. Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty well done. The yeah. the research does. I mean, you would recognize the names on who's who's working with them on it. Um, it's a number of a number of organizations. Sure. Yeah, I was just kind of interested to kind of root these point too of are these people who are kind of really in depth in this particular field, so you are kind of selectively. Surveying. It's really fast uh, in comparison to dropshipping and e-commerce. I got to tell you that that's usually like three to five years. It's a really long haul before you basically start making enough money to support yourself. Hmm. Um, there's some really good interviewers out there that, you know, get people to start talking about the first couple of years, which are awful. I mean, you just don't make anything. You're constantly building and adding to it and you're working for nothing during that period of time. So that's a that's a quick payback model, but it's also really funny considering the, the courses and the, the like of that's where they're making money is yeah. bring that around. I've always kind of had that problem with um, affiliates and drop shippers because it's like that joke of how you make a million bucks in the stock market. You say you write a book about how you made a million bucks in the stock market and you sell it for a dollar each, sell it to a million people, and now you've made a million bucks. I mean, if no one makes it, no one actually does it, and there's a whole lot of people who talk about it instead. Um, mm -hmm. And then as for course AI, I made an AI course, took you know about three minutes as the AI generated a course for me this last week. It was pretty junky training copy kind of stuff, but there was activities. And from what I could tell, it was accurate in the data and the, you know, what it was putting together and all the different modules that it said, a little bit repetitive too, wasn't very good, but it took three minutes. So. You should publish it, Alex. Exactly. Oh, you have the grant. 
No, you can have it was advanced techniques for Jira. I was I wanted to kind of come up with something that was kind of like obscure that oh, I was going to just test the model and be curious. Do it. Oh, I know, right? Sure you know. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it was it was. I mean, it's a dry topic to begin with, but it was it was not good. To all of our friends at Atlassian, yeah. I have you know use your product, and it's your your products are great, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I think it will, maybe we'll do a, a deeper look into this because um, there was an interesting piece of, you know, there was only a, the average number of audience size was only about 4,000 people, you know, because one of the misconceptions is that you really need a crazy amount of audience in order to make this a profitable thing. Uh, and it, at least for the the content entrepreneur side, like if you are doing consulting, if you are doing these other things, you're pretty much B2B, right? So you're not necessarily going to be uh, needing that volume of uh, audience in order to have a profitable um, organization. Plus, if you're only doing digital things, you're, you know, your upfront costs are pretty low. Uh, your tech stack is probably pretty low i mean because there's so many good free tools out there that you know you end up having gross margins that are ridiculous well that's what you said about covering expenses i was thinking when i went freelance doing seo work my expense was a laptop and like the cheapest version of quickbooks and that mm -hmm. was it like you mean frog license alex the frog <laughs> wasn't out back then i don't think <laughs> 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 But there was, yeah, you're right. There was a annual software cost that I spent on a different platform that was like maybe hundred bucks a month. But mm -hmm. that's what I was thinking. Like my total costs for the first year was pretty, pretty cheap. So mm -hmm. being able to cover your expenses, I was like, well, that's, that's not much. Yeah. The thing I appreciate about this research, whether or not it's perfect, right? Cause no research is ever going to be perfect and you're never going to have big enough sample sizes to make anybody happy. Um, but it's at least trying to quantify it, right? Because that is a large part of our, um, it is a large part of our economy. And when you ask kids what they want to be, it's YouTube creator. Well, you have to have an infrastructure around if you're going to be <laughs> having all of these kids try it out, you know? Um, I think we just found our coaching opportunity right there. YouTube yeah, right. coaching. They talk as well. I mean, throw an actual full social media gambit. I mean, that was what, that's always the story about the gold rush. Nobody made money mining in the gold rush. It was the people who sold them shovels that made the money. Mm -hmm. it's like still generational wealth still from that, which is ridiculous. So don't become the influencer. Sell to the influencers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when they burn out, you just get a new one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, on that lovely... Uh, business is not my friend note. Um, Alex, replacing yeah. people with AI on your team. Oh, yeah. What this do you want to talk hard. about? Is so that... <laughs> talked about something timely as well with the, the Met Gala, but yeah. IBM CEO recently made a statement, which I'm going to rant about for a little bit, but then we'll get into a more realistic and actionable topic. I, I do promise that. Um, basically, he said that they are going to, through attrition, not a direct layoff, but over the next five years, which is articles keep glossing over, the next five years, through attrition, they will reduce their staff by 7,600, 7,800 people who are back end office, non client facing, customer facing roles. Uh, mentioned a lot about HR and accounting and that they were going to replace those roles with AI and they will t pause on all hires who could, you know, the roles could be replaced with automation of some sort. And interesting. I, I have a lot of problems with that. Um, one, over the next five years, you're going to save the company a bunch of money. That's in CEO tenure ship. That's a great thing to tell a bunch of people during your quarterly results and never have to fulfill that promise of, I mean, that's a, that's a heck of a statement. And he's been all about cost savings and efficiency. And IBM has been kind of known to kind of throw their name on the latest thing and try to tie their name into it. And I got to admit, the last time I thought of IBM was quite a long time ago, because I think of 
AWS with Amazon Web Services and all the servers and AI stuff that's attached to that now. You have Google with all that. You have Azure with Microsoft. I don't know where IBM really fits into the world anymore, kind of, to be honest. Somewhere, I'm not really sure where. And this is the next point, which I was kind of feeding into this thought from uh, last week that I had. I was basically... I think this is way too premature to be also stating so clearly that you know where AI fits and to say that AI can take over a role completely. Mm-hmm. That that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, BuzzFeed and others who have cut writers, I get that. Yes, ChatGPT and a lot of these LLMs can absolutely create content and the content's pretty decent. So I get that. But the idea that you can replace people in HR, accounting, I mean, that's been theorized by Goldman Sachs and others that you can potentially cut bookkeepers, kind of lower level ones. Um, But I still don't, I just still don't buy it. And I still don't think we're at the point where people are at the point of saying, this is exactly where AI fits and where you can kind of slot in AI. And that's, that's the other piece that I've been trying to think about this last kind of two weeks has been on a team, where does AI fit? So for instance, I'm a project manager. Let's kind of make a marketing example out of it. Um, I've got a, a new web page that I want to get out there. So I need copywritten, I need design and imagery, and I need somebody to put it on the site. And I probably want the SEO guy to be involved or person, sorry, SEO person to be involved with it as well to talk about the keywords and you know, sprinkle on that SEO magic on top of it. So where does AI fit? You know, I've got a team of people and in my mind at my current company, I can think of who I would talk to, to do those different tasks. And I could also kind of figure out, okay, some of those can probably be fit by AI and some of them really can't be. And if I tell the SEO, Hey, now you're in charge of chat GPT to create the article and you need to edit it. And it probably won't be as good as somebody who actually is professionally a writer. Um, I need to use stable diffusion or, or you know any kind of other diffusion model to mid-journey, you name it, to create the imagery. Well, I got to learn how to use those systems and spend my time doing that too. And then I need a CMS or something that's user-friendly enough for me to be able to upload it versus a developer's time to add it to the site. There's all these, and then there's testing added to it. So... I kind of get where AI fits. And I also see a major problem with it too, of it may in, you know, increase productivity in some areas, but it's also going to decrease productivity because now you've got one person doing the job of multiple and jobs that they're not necessarily a professional in and they're you know experienced with. So the quality probably suffers a bit. And now that person isn't doing the other job that they're normally doing. So that's one kind of pieces like where does AI fit on a team, you know, trying to like manage, you know, manage roles. Um, the other piece of it is the idea of automation in general takes investment and it takes time. And like Mark Zuckerberg had a point about like, you know, getting rid of old tools and creating efficiency through that. I, I totally get that. That totally makes sense. I, I imagine we all work at a company that has a whole bunch of tech debt that we'd love to get rid of and kick to the curb, but you don't, because it takes a lot of effort to do it and you need to prioritize it. And that takes cost. And the idea of, you know, that's my other issue with IBM is the idea that you're just going to not fulfill roles and that somehow these jobs are going to get automated as a joke. That's, that's not accurate. You're going to have to spend money and time to figure out how to automate these roles, create that, implement it, and then also maintain it. It's a whole lot of costs. So, and that's a whole lot of time and projects by a whole bunch yeah. of people. So you can't just over so, time bring an AI. A couple of thoughts. Yeah. So with the BuzzFeed model, and I think you're seeing this in a lot of media sites right now, even if ChatGPT or you know the, the large language writer assistant things didn't come around, there's a problem with ad supported mediums right now, right? Buzzfeed shut down their news department because it was no longer 
tenable, you know, with the ad supported piece. Um, you know, you have a lot of the the New York Times writers and and, and writers worth their salt doing the the Substack stuff. But again, that's a subscription model, not the ad supported thing, right? Um, so there's that kind of infrastructure piece. Um, you know, I mean, I've noticed through you know the smaller businesses, even like ten years ago, you could tell that through the different automations and the different tech stacks that were coming up, you would have these individual tools, right? Like your QuickBooks, and then you'd have your, you know, HubSpots and and whatever else. And each one did a very specific thing. Well, over the last, you know, 10, 12 years, they've gotten really good at doing a lot of things because, Mm -hmm. you know, our economy has supported bigness um, and and being the all-in-one kind of platforms for that. So, I can see over time, a lot of that innovation of, you know, connect your QuickBooks to your website to handle your automatic e-commerce payments to then make sure that your invoices are automatically sent. All of that's been there for small businesses and um, uh, like solopreneurs and all of that for years. But there's never been an, an enterprise level thing that does that well. Right. So now it, it, you could be at a point where through GPT or through the tools integrating all of these other things into their offerings to the enterprise clients, you're now better able to do that at that grand scale. All right. Yeah. I, I, I think the systems are too limited. Like, we are seeing massive evolution in AI. I mean, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. We're now seeing on a weekly basis some pretty amazing releases from models. So that's going like like crazy. But we're still not kind of, we're still selective in these models where they just do the one thing. You know, stable diffusion diffusion related models do their thing. LLMs do text. Mm-hmm. We don't have, uh, it's called AGI, kind of an artificial general intelligence sort of a thing that ties multiple things together yet. And then also, especially at the enterprise level, my gosh, the random criteria and requirements that enterprise organizations come up with, they have a tendency to kill software. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, I need this, this, and this, and you're going to have to support .NET Nuke. And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a requirement. Yeah. It's a $10 million contract, but you also need to incorporate software from 10 years ago. By the way, boil the ocean too. Thanks. Yeah, right. <laughs> All the features. I love this question. Alex, and I also love your rant at the beginning. That was sort of a good mm-hmm. context setting. And I, I imagine listeners are have their wheels turning as well because this is this is a good one. And I think this is this touches on a lot of the challenges that we see as AI comes online um, or becomes popularized, and as we deal with our day to day in in marketing at enterprises or smaller organizations. And the IBM CEO, I mean, gosh, a couple thoughts. One is I can't help but comment. This is these are the creators of Watson. They had big ideas of what that could do, and that didn't work. They out won today. a chess tournament. Yay! <laughs> I think Facebook won a Go tournament. So. So that's cool. But, you know, you and I, the three of us have talked in the past about some of the problems with upskilling over time. It's very hard to do. How do you get a large organization or different groups of people to upskill and think differently about how they've done their role in the past? It's like there's technical debt, but then there's also process debt that you have to overcome. And if I'm IBM CEO, some of the things I might be thinking about are if we don't take advantage of this technology, we're just going to get wiped out by all the companies who are able to do so. How do we go about solving for that? And this is one way to force the hands of saying we've got to upskill, we've got to shift, we have to do things differently. There's not really a choice to it. At the same time, it's a struggle because the people who are left in the roles aren't the types of people necessarily who are going to be able to implement all this automation. So you need an infrastructure within IBM that enables that to happen as well, that works to to create those different connections. 
the the thing that strikes me as you guys are talking about like AI certainly it's it's evolving fast but a lot of the technologies to automate are already in place mm -hmm. the problem is the technical debt is in is in such a state that you can't use those if you have sort of a custom set of of tools that you've sort of frankensteined over time coming in and applying a new tool that automates everything is very challenging you almost have to you have to re-platform or you have to find a, a, a different set of solutions, which again, takes retraining of roles. You know, it's, I, I, I'm skeptical of just, we're not gonna hire new people um, as these go out the door is the, the only thing that you do to, to solve for that. Um, you need a new infrastructure and of people as well to support these new automating technologies. And Alex, to your point of, you know, the average tenure of a CEO who can afford to say stupid things. An old CEO who's probably out the door anyway. The one with the golden parachute. Yeah. Yeah. So you can yeah. say whatever you want. It doesn't matter because you have yours already. The rest of the organization is just going to be stuck with either implementing it or changing direction as soon as your um, as soon as your replacement takes your spot. So but even if we take it as face value, let, let's assume that IBM CEO does plan to see this out. Maybe he does. I, I don't know. Maybe this is a way to force the hand of a company that's when it's real. You know, I think the the analogy you've used in the past, Alex, is it's an armada shifting direction, right? Startups are these little boats that can swerve around and things. But if you've got a large enterprise, you've got to coordinate a lot of different groups and teams who are all working on sort of different, you've got to direct them in a, in one way. And if you want to move them, that is a huge challenge. This is one way you could, this is one way to do it. You just set the expectation. You say, this is where we're going. Everybody align. The other thought that comes up, you asked the question about like, where does AI fit in our teams? And I think for me, the answer at this point in time with what, with, with the emerging technologies and where we are and knowing that we have existing processes and existing roles in place, it's a, it's more of a yes. And it's like, it's not that AI is replacing certain roles necessarily. It's we're using AI to amplify the human capital that we have to say we can now do more or we can do better or we can do different rather than wholesale wiping out our copywriters. It's okay, now you can take a head start and you can do better copy because of this, for example. So that's yeah. where my mind falls. See it also in terms of kind of where it currently stands today, again, trying to use that static mindset, which probably isn't helpful, you know, six months down the road because things are going to change. But right now I'm thinking of Kind of a senior software developer who can who's gotten a bunch of little random tickets and they're able to crank out a couple extra because they're using chat gbt to help write code which developers googling and copying each other's code is i mean standard so that that's that's of no surprise so maybe you have one less entry level hire because you have a senior person who is smart enough and experienced enough to be able to do this quickly incorporate it into their workflow, review it, and then be able to implement it knowing that it's going to work. And then maybe you have one less entry level hire per larger team. I mean, it's still not like a full person either. Um, I th think of like, there was a Ars Technica had a, a good um, kind of comment section, I got to admit, from the, the IBM article. And there's these two comments that really stood out to me. One of them was talking about some different call centers and service lines that they've called and they follow this script that's just not helpful and they keep kind of running into this and they said they made this quote of if you do your job like a robot you're going to get replaced by a robot and that yeah i get those i get those roles i mean yeah there's some value to a human being being in those roles from a kind of empathy standpoint but if they really aren't able to solve a problem and they're just there to, I don't know, frustrate the heck out of you or something, you know, Comcast. Um, <laughs> that maybe, yeah, you could replace that with AI. And then another comment, which I think was also really poignant, was saying about how they refuse in their company to use automated call centers 
and how their customers are so happy to talk to a person and to feel like they're being heard and connecting with the company and feeling, you know, a sense of lo loyalty. That also is then a point of differentiation of if a lot of companies go towards AI heavy things of, again, being, you know, the organic one or the, the human one and saying, no, we're, we're going to do things differently. We refuse to have a 10 minute wait time in a call center. Instead, we're going to have people who are very well trained or people who have a wide range of kind of bandwidth to be able to solve a problem. Well, and this goes back to our conversation a couple episodes ago where we talk about, you know, what are you optimizing for? What are the actual KPIs your company cares about? Because if it's only going to be the bean counters that are driving free cash flow, you're screwed. You'll never have a good experience. You won't ever truly be customer first because you're only ever going to be optimizing for capital. Um, I do think it makes sense from the start, I'm not justifying what he said, but I do think it makes sense that you start with the back end, right? Because the front end side, which I think the AI has gotten a lot of attention for, uh, you know, in terms of like writing all the eBooks, writing the white papers, writing, you know, these kinds of things. That is your connection to your customer. That is the relationship, right? You don't outsource your relationship. Right. If you think back to junior high and you go, hey, best friend, I like this girl. Can you go ask her out for me? What happens? The girl goes out with your friend, not you, because you didn't step up and do what was necessary. Right. Like that. That's going to happen if you're not providing a good experience and you're not owning the relationship, then, you know, you don't own the outcome either. So anyway. How was prom for you, Dave? <laughs> I didn't go because I had a rehearsal. <laughs> Again, because I was prioritizing the music. I had to go do a, a study, um, an audition for college that week. So I didn't go, but I did do other dances. <laughs> so I'm not a total loser. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, on that cheerful, happy note, thank you everybody for hanging out. Like, subscribe, share, give us show notes uh, and any of your feedback, episode ideas, anything. Let us know. Hit us up online. You got the the um, links to how to get to us, you know, in the, the YouTube description. And, um, you know, we do put a lot of effort into the show notes and the transcripts on the website. It's a repository of all the webinars and research and links to cool things. So, you know, go go check those things out. Um, that has definitely been where I have caught up on all of the things you guys have mentioned <laughs> in putting together those things. So uh, we will see you in the next episode of Enterprising Minds. Thank you and see you next week.